Football is not just a game, but a way of life. <laughs> Alright, maybe I'm being dramatic. But it's a game I fell in love with from a very young age. And like everything in life, it has changed a lot. But does that change always equate to improvements? According to some football fans, football has fallen off or football fell off. So I've decided to delve into the heart of the matter and look into some of these changes and decide if football as an overall package really did fall off. Rule changes are a double-edged sword that are both enhanced and detracted from the drama of football. The offside rule, a common source of debate, has seen so many changes and honestly, I've stopped caring about what is offside and what is not. If the ref blows the whistle offside, no problem. If not, let's go, play on. And right now, IFAB has approved the testing of yet another change in the rules. Marcos rash decisions and Abaru Murata might eat good with this new rule. But the general consensus amongst football fans is that the rule makes no sense. But I miss the decision making of this public belly dude men that clearly know nothing about football, we still get something undeniable, we get drama. And honestly, more than goals, more than trophies, this is probably what sports fans love the most. If you check Twitter, if you check everywhere, it's in the blood of the game, you just can't deny it. The drama of the rule change is directly tied into another thing fans complain about which is VAR. For some fans, it is the savior of the game and on the other side of the divide, some fans think it is a game killer. I really think both sides have a point. VAR and goal line technology have robbed us of some drama like the Lampard goes goal and that Chelsea Barcelona Champions League clash. But let's not forget how much fans absolutely hated those episodes. I vividly remember how Chelsea fans reacted the next day when I got to school and how we all celebrated the implementation of these new technologies. The problem has always been a constant. Yes, the refs. We all watched AFCON and we saw a showcase on how VAR should be used in its best form. But somehow the top European leagues do their best to find the worst referees in history week in and week out. In a sport like football, where the fans complain about not having competitive football every offseason, you would think that having more games would be something the fans would celebrate. But the fans are smart enough to accept and realize that the body of footballers can only take so much. Back in the day, FIFA and UEFA actively strived to put out the best products possible. And researching this video, this actually surprised me. Back in 2002, FIFA and UEFA made efforts to reduce the match load of players as the World Cup was marred by injuries. They were still protecting their pockets, so, but at least it's the thought that counts. These days, they are the ones actually pushing to make players play more games for longer. They've extended at a time and get this, over the next 31 months, there will be a 32 team club world cup, a 48 team world cup and a revamped champions league format. Top level footballers would have no rest until 2026. If it don't fall out the bone, make it's free. Even at the time of writing this video, there has been a long procession of players pulling out of the international break with injuries or having injury scares. And I know, who cares, right? They get paid a ton of money to kick a ball. But having this many games will just serve to dilute the quality of the game. This is a sentiment echoed by people that remember the previous era of football to be tougher than it actually was. The refing of the game has probably gotten worse, but you can't really lean on that because it's always been bad. The criteria for getting cautioned and carded is virtually the same, and stats prove it. Of the top 10 most yellow cards in a Premier League season's list, only one, yes, only one has come in the last 5 years. The rest of the top 10 are seasons that go as far back as the beginning of the century. Same players are weak mentally compared to the past is just not true. Mental health is a real thing that every human being struggles with, including footballers of the previous generations. They just didn't have a safe space to talk about it. I'm a pretty big mixed martial arts fan and I think most people will agree that MMA fighters are some of the baddest motherfuckers on the planet. But even those big scary guys that put people to sleep with their fists struggle with mental health. Um, I, I never thought I'd struggle with it but I mean like for some reason when I wasn't fighting or, or in care, fuck sorry. I'll just do my head in, you know what I mean? I needed a fight and then uh, this opportunity to come up and... I think that, you know, I have everything. I'm, I'm rich, I'm famous, like I have everything I've ever f***ing wanted and I still am mentally unwell. Are these warriors soft for struggling with mental health? While this may have been true once upon a time, it just isn't anymore. Pep Guardiola joined Manchester City in 2016 and honestly, the bout fraud went crazy as he spent 170 million and 267 million in consecutive seasons, replacing anything that wasn't working the way he wanted with the exact player that fit the mood, breaking transfer records in almost every single position. But recently, we've seen him adapt to the players at his disposal and shape his tactics to fit those players almost on a game-by-game -game basis. We've also seen him buy and field players 
players that fit a different mode compared to the pair type of players that we are used to. Even Guardiola himself has admitted to this. So I learned a lot of my players and I changed a lot of things because of my players. They teach me, they show me what I have to change. Mm -hmm. People believe, no, Pep changed that. They, 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 the, the, the managers, if you observe or try to do it with Starbuck room and stuff, you learn what you have to change through your players. They teach you. And honestly, if most fans just watch the games, instead of following every popular agenda like sheep, they would see Guardiola in an entirely different light. <laughs> Tactical chess matches are just the meta at the moment. Pressing from the front and adhering to the coach's tactics was the meta during the time of Arigosaki. And he butted head with Roberto Baggio a lot of times for it. Total football and positional play was the meta when Rinus Mike was coaching those Ajax teams too. This is the WM formation, one of the earliest versions of a formation in the 1930s. Please tell me what you find familiar in this formation. Yes. That's a box midfield. When we saw it last season, it was like we discovered gold, but it's been in existence since forever. Nothing is new in football. Every one of these modern formations and tactics have been present in the past in one form or another. New managers just take these tactics and combine them with a modern twist. Ten years from now, other coaches will definitely do the same. And now, let's talk about the planet-sized elephants in the room, Messi and Ronaldo. These two absolute legends are both once-in-a-generation footballers, and that's where the problem is. This kind of goat-level players exist one at a time, and the prime of their careers really overlap in the way that we saw with Messi and Ronaldo. If we look at the examples across history, the Stefano and Puskas were probably the only goat-level duo that existed at the same time. But they were both teammates, so their competition with each other wasn't the same, and football really wasn't truly global at the time. They were both well-known locally but not at the level that can be traced back to Pele's era. Pele played from 1956 to 1977, ending his career just as another good candidate was starting out. Rinse and repeat the process of Maradona and Ronaldo de Lima. All this to say, the Messi and Ronaldo rivalry was just one of a kind. Their career paths put them in a direct line of fire against each other, and their rivalry pushed them to achieve things that we never even saw before. Ronaldo came back from being down 3-1 in the Balloon Dior count to level at 5, before Messi stole some more to get ahead, but let's not talk about that. One might say these two guys actually spent too long at the top, and that stunted the growth of the next generation. Neymar was supposed to be the next in line amongst all-time greats, but the best periods of his career that were uninterrupted by injuries were spent finishing third behind Messi and Ronaldo in 2017 and 2015. The achievements of the new generation would probably not seem so lackluster if these guys stopped as ruining Neymar's ghost case. But no, <laughs> they also had to take a bite out of the Haaland and Mbappe era. Mbappe has two fantastic World Cup campaigns campaigns under his belt and nobody cares. Alan just had a treble winning campaign, breaking every goal scoring record he could get his hands on, except the Messi and Ronaldo ones of course, and still nobody cares. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. For years, a lot of fans and the football world in general have foiled this rivalry, while in turn we also got foiled by it. So when these two rode off into the sunset, we had nothing to hold on to and it felt like football lost its source. Nobody can be like them and we really can't recreate anything like that rivalry anymore. In every sport, the next generation is better than the last for the pure reasons that these players grew up watching Messi and Ronaldo play and they tried the things they saw on the TV in their backyards. That is why a player like Jude Bellingham can have such a similar game to his idol or Mbappe being a light version of Ronaldo. It's just how life is. The next generation always learns from and improve on what the previous generation has done. These days, every single player in the average team is a supreme athlete. Football has definitely become more interesting as a result of having better players and managers. The distance between the top teams or even nations and the rest of the lot has reduced considerably and the parity has resulted in a much better product where a Liverpool or Manchester City game against Luton Town can produce a back and forth game regardless of the scoreline. We've had fantastic tournaments over the past few years. Just look at the Champions League quarterfinal draw. Almost every single one of these matches are a toss-up and you can really make the case for like 70% of the teams involved to go ahead and win the whole thing. Just a few months ago, the AFCON took over the world, with some people even claiming that it was better than the Euros or the Copa America. You get the point. Football is evolving and it will keep evolving. Right now, it's the era of tactics, X's and O's, and ultra-efficient players like Bukayo Saka that give coaches wet dreams. But the next 10 years might see the return of dribblers after they grew up watching Vinicius trick and skill his way to a likely legendary career. So, has football falling off? Not really. You just need to rediscover your love for football. Thank you for watching this video. Smash that like button and subscribe. You can also turn on notifications so you don't miss the next video.